А сега давам думата на президента на Чешката република, професор Васов Пасов Класов. Пане президенте. Мистер президент, президент, it's incredible to have three presidents coming here today. I I appreciate it very much. I'm really honored. Um, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, um, many thanks for the publishing of these two books of mine in your country and in your language. I really appreciate it very much. It may hopefully give at least to interested and concerned readers the direct contact with my views, not with their very often intentional and calculated caricature in the, in the media, especially in Western Europe. Thank you for organizing this gathering. Let me express my gratitude to all who made this moment possible, to the publishers of the two books, to Stock Zapad Publishing House and to Mac Publishing House, to the translators, Angelina Pencheva and Petio Angelov, Angelov, and especially to the former Bulgarian ambassador to the Czech Republic, Zdravko Popov, for all his help and for his very nice words on the back cover of one of the books. The first book, which I came to introduce here today, Gdje započva utre, was written and published in the Czech language more than two years ago as my contribution to the 20th anniversary of the fall of communism. My intention was to put both the fall of communism and the current era into a broader perspective into the continuity of time. The book starts with the chapter called The Day Before Yesterday which contains my discussion of what was before, what we left behind, what we got rid of. To my great regret, I don't see serious books about communism. In the communist era, people like me were dreaming about writing political, economic, sociological books about communism when there would be chance to publish them. But we became, unexpectedly for most of us, we became politicians and didn't have the time to do it. These books are still missing and I feel it as a problem. What we have at our disposal are more or less passive, non-theoretical, historic descriptions plus, undoubtedly more than justified, ideological rejections of communism, of this very oppressive, destructive, undemocratic, inefficient and unproductive system. But there is not enough of serious analysis. My point is that we have to differentiate between the normative model of communism which the students learned at universities in Prague and Sofia, and perhaps in New York City and Boston as well, in the past, and the real system in which we lived. It is frustrating that not only the communist propaganda was based on the concept of this non-existent hypothetical model, Today's superficial and simplified discussions of communism are based on a similarly distorted and simplified picture. I guess you may have similar experience in your country. The second chapter of the book called Yesterday discusses the process, how we went from one system to another, from communism to capitalism. It was possible to make bigger or smaller mistakes, to make the transition more or less costly in terms of GDP, inflation, unemployment. But I am convinced that the movement of all the countries was in the same direction. 
we all wanted to build a free democratic system based on a parliamentary democracy and market economy. Chapter three is called Today. I ask myself whether we are now, where, where we are now, whether we have already arrived at the destination where we wanted to be, capitalism, parliamentary democracy, market economy. My answer was and is mixed. Nominally, we are there, but the reality, I don't mean just the Czech or Bulgarian reality, but the European reality as well, is not a full-fledged parliamentary democracy and or a genuine market economy. We have less democracy because of the post-democratic nature of the European Union and less of a market economy because of the paternalistic, demotivating, redistributive welfare state, the so-called die soziale Marktwirtschaft in German. Chapter 4, called Tomorrow, is inevitably the shortest one. I am not a forecaster, and it's not a forecast. It's a speculation based on the hypothesis that the current trends will continue. My conclusion is that I am afraid of post-democracy, I am afraid of the extensively defined human rights and would prefer to stay with civil rights. I am afraid of the growing role of NGOs, of juristocracy, of political correctness, of multiculturalism, of global governance. All these phenomena are part of our current European experience which brings me to the, to the second book. As regards the second book, Yevro Integratia Bez Illusi, uh, its title is I Believe Accurate. I have no illusions. I am afraid that many Europeans have not been paying sufficient attention to developments at our continent or have not looked at them analytically. The European integration was originally based on a rational and positive ambition of its founders to liberalize Europe, to open it up, to eliminate all kinds of barriers existing at the borders of the countries, to establish a free trade zone and a custom union, to build a common market and a large interconnected economic space. These tendencies, more or less, with tendencies I consider positive, these tendencies more or less characterized the first decades of the post-Second World War European integration process. They do not, however, represent uh, the right description of the current era. The overall liberalization and removal of inter-country barriers were replaced by ambitions that are very different, by excessive centralization, regulation, standardization, and harmonization of the whole continent, by a radical shift of competencies from EU member countries to the European Union's commanding heights, European Union headquarters in Brussels, um, by the transformation of the whole concept of integration from intergovernmentalism to su supranationalism by the intentional and organized weakening of the cohesion of European member states and by a wide-ranging shift towards European governance. 
the current institutional uniformity became a straitjacket which keeps blocking all kinds of positive and productive human activities. It is most visible in the European Monetary Union and in the introduction of one currency in a group of originally 12 and now 17 countries that do not form, in economic terminology, an optimal currency area. The undergoing European sovereign debt crisis is an inevitable consequence of one currency, one exchange rate, and one interest rate for countries with very diverse economic parameters. The political decision in favor of this arrangement was taken without sufficient attention being paid to the underlying economic fundamentals. In addition to the problems with the concept of integration itself, there is a huge inefficiency of the European economic and social system. The European soziale Marktwirtschaft, as it is aptly called in German, prefers social policy based on income redistribution to productive activities. It prefers leisure, free time, and long holidays to hard work. It prefers consumption to investments, debt to savings, and security to risk taking. All of this is part of a broader civilizational and cultural framework deeply rooted in the European continent or in most of its countries. Due to it, it can't be changed overnight. It can't be replaced as a decision of one or another EU summit. It can't be corrected by painless or cosmetic changes. To make Europe functional and productive again requires a deep systemic change, something, something structurally, structurally similar to the task we had to accomplish more than two decades ago in the Czech Republic and in Bulgaria when we wanted to get rid of communism. The Czech Republic, as Bulgaria, still use their own currencies. We were sufficiently and in advance aware of the problems connected with the wrongly constructed monetary union. We didn't want to impede our economic growth. We wanted to continue our much needed overall adjustment process with sufficient adjustment capabilities, which required and requires our own flexible exchange rates, our own interest rates, and our own monetary policy. We, and now I don't want to speak on behalf of your country, but I hope, we didn't find any advantage in using the German or Greek exchange rate and interest rates. For the time being, speaking for the Czech Republic, we don't have any plans to enter the Eurozone. The escaping from the European crisis needs, as I said, a fundamental systemic change, which means at least two things. The substantial transformation of the European social and economic system, on the one hand, and um, the restructuring of the European institutional or political arrangements in another terminology of the form of European integration. Uh, what should be the, I, I would suggest at the end of my presentation, what should be the main components of such a change? I summarized it in six points. First, 
we have to get rid of the unproductive and paternalistic soziale Marktwirtschaft, augmented, which means farther undermined by the growing role of the green ideology. Second, we have to accept that the short-term economic adjustment processes take time and that the impatient politicians and governments usually make things worse. The European politicians should not try to mastermind the market, to micromanage the economy, to create growth by government stimuli and incentives. My third point is we should in an effort to escape the debt trap, prepare comprehensive reductions of government expenditures and forget flirting with tax increases. These reductions, these cuts, must dominantly deal with mandatory expenditures of the state budget because discretionary spending cuts are, in the longer run, quantitatively more or less insignificant. Number four, we should stop the creeping but constantly expanding green legislation. We should not let the greens to take over much of our economy under the banner of such flawed ideas as the global warming doctrine. Number five, we should stop the centralization, harmonization, standardization of the European continent and after half a century of such measures start again decentralizing, deregulating, desubsidizing our society and our economy. And my final point, point number six, we have to return to democracy, which can exist only at the level of nation states, not at the level of the whole continent. We have to return from supranationalism to intergovernmentalism. These are, in a very short way, the main, main ideas of those two books which were just published in your language. I hope, once again, thank you very much for doing it and I hope that my books could contribute to the discussion of these issues in your country. Thank you very much for your attention. Добър ден, казвам се Аделина Марини от EU Insight. Господин Клаус, споменахте, че, т.е. призовахте за връщане от наднационалността към междуправителствеността, но има вече такъв процес, който тече и много страни членки го критикуват, защото той обикновенно се води от Германия и Франция, можем да кажем това. По-добрият вариант ли е или има и трети път? Благодаря. Well, first, uh, uh, I, I am not the one who, uh, in my opinion, rather cheaply criticizes uh, Germany and France, you know. I am afraid it's a sort of uh, allowed criticism. It's something, uh, as in the communist past, it was impossible to criticize the system, but I'm sure some of you remember that it was possible to criticize the bureaucracy. 
and uh, people like me were always very unhappy with criticizing the bureaucracy in the communist era. It was a consequence of something else, not the primer, not the prime moving moving factor. Um, I am afraid that uh, it's popular now uh, that the smaller EU countries are criticizing the big countries. That's, in my opinion, not the point. Again, the problem is the structure of the system, not the behavior of one president or prime minister in one or another EU country. So this is not my, my position.